Welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast, Episode 6. That's our biggest problem in livestock agriculture, at least on grazing side. If people are most interested in the animal, you know, and they need to take a better look at, at their land resource that they do have access to and better matching their animal to that land resource. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers produce forages for livestock. On today's episode, we have Ben Hobbig of Hobbig Livestock. He comes in and talks about a livestock species that most of us are a little afraid of having. Yes, I'm talking about goats. Those animals that dream of ways to get out. Ben talks about his unique approach to attaining land to graze goats and then how he's managing them. I think you're going to enjoy it. And let's get to it. Well, Ben, we're excited to have you on the Grazing Grass Podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited about being here and and visiting with you. Ben, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your operation? 34 years old. I I live in Weatherford, Texas. I've been, uh, been grazing for approximately three and a half years now, I think is where it's at. And... My operation is a meat goat operation where I attempt to uh, rotation and graze goats on a on a lease property in conjunction with a cow calf operator who also leases the property, and so I cooperate with him, and uh, you know graze those goats simultaneously. I primarily subdivide my pastures with uh, two strands of poly wire temporary fence. And uh, I'm able to control my goats that way and uh, try uh, try to put them where I want them across the property, target some areas a little bit and um, do a spring kidding operation. We kid out the end of March, starting the end of March, and uh, usually we're done three to four weeks. Market those kids generally in the fall sometime, October-ish. They'll weigh roughly 60 pounds run kind of a Spanish boar cross type of goat. You know, it's a commercial goat, not registered, or we're not trying to hit some uh, special bloodlines or anything like that. That's kind of the gist of the operation. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. So you're something that stuck out to me right then. You're using lease land, and you're cooperating with someone who's running beef cows there too. Yes, sir. So yep. t- tell me a little bit more about how that works. Well, you know, the way it works is that operator, he he has that property leased to run his cattle. And basically, I I have an agreement with him to run my goats simultaneous with him uh, that we worked out between the two of us. And it's basically a sublease is how it works. I don't don't know. um, I guess I would would start off saying that I went to him and, you know, wanted to run these goats and, and he was, he wanted that opportunity. He wanted to do something like that on his place, but didn't have the knowledge experience or the desire to really to mess with those goats. So, you know, there's an opportunity for me to do oh, what yes. I'm doing. Oh yes. That's great. Does he rotationally graze his cows or are Unfor- the, he's more traditional? He's more traditional. And, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, that that's kind of the way it's, it's worked uh, for him. Uh, not what I would like, but you know that's what we've been given. I, I don't have a, a land base that right. I come from, so I'm somebody that was looking for an opportunity, wanted to wanted to graze cattle in this area, and looked around and looked around for lease ground, which, ground, which is very difficult here and everywhere else under the sun. Oh yes, it is. So you know, I, I had to uh, research and and think of outside the box and uh, kind of finally came up with this this uh, conclusion and, and this idea and, and I went down that path and made it happen. So, yeah. And when you talked to him, so he was open to the idea because he had some interest in goats. Does the lease land have some a lot of brush or? That's primarily why he was interested in it. It wasn't so much that he had a burning desire to be a goat rancher. <laughs> oh, <but>, yes. <laughs> uh, um, it was more the, the, the resource that's available on, on the land. You know, where we're at oh, yes. is, is a kind of a cross timbers, rolling prairie, 
area of Texas, the it's kind of very at the very edge of maybe what some people might call the hill country of Texas, where there is a lot of, of brush, woody, woody plants, oh, brow, yes. browse kind of species that are favorable to, to running small ruminants on it. And so we have a little bit of that on this property and, and uh, you know, he understands that and sees that potential there. And, and more than anything, it, it's kind of a thing for him of, okay, he's running, he's running these cows on, on this place, but how many of these, these acres are really grazeable for his mother cows and how much of it is he paying, oh, yes. for, paying for that he's really not getting any grazing out of. And so basically I'm, you know, I'm kind of supplementing, you know, that lease, if you will, right. um, and trying to better utilize those acres that, that aren't giving anything directly back to his cow herd. It, it, that's kind of the idea. It's not quite oh, yes. that black and white, but that that's kind of, you know, what we're trying to do. Right. And I, I think that's a, a very unique and creative approach to get some lease land. You bet. Um, like you mentioned, finding lease land, I've been looking for a long time and sure. I get a few leads. I don't make it too far, but Right. Yeah, that's a very creative approach to it. And you said, so you have them on this place and you're using poly wire? Yes, sir. To yes, sir. to make your paddocks? Yes, sir. Um, I use two strands of poly wire. I, I prefer the, the braided poly wire, the, oh, the, yes. the, the braided PowerFlex poly braid. And, uh, but I use that with, with step in post and I can subdivide these pastures that way. And and also, some of this property has really good fence that can hold a goat very well. And some of it has oh, yes. fence that is not good at all. It's, you know, it's old, <laughs> rotten net wire from 70 years ago with holes all oh, through yes. it. So in some of those places, I actually use my temporary fence to offset against that perimeter fence. And, oh, and, yes. You know, and make that pasture goat tight basically. So unfor- that's the downfall to my operation is it's labor intensive. I, you know, I'm making, putting up a lot of fence and taking it down, but you know, that's the card I'm playing right now. Right. I, uh, I have a, I have a mobile energizer. It's on a, I've got a mounted solar panel energizer on a little trailer. And so I can, can move that around. So I don't, I don't even have the luxury of having this place, you know, all the way around with, with high tensile to hook on to oh, and yes. run my power supply. So that, and like I say, that's where it's at right now. I'm grazing by the way, roughly the unit that I'm on is about, close just under a thousand acres so it's not huge but it's not small depending on where of course you're at in the world so I don't, does that answer that question is it that's good about how many goats are you running just under 300 head that's what we have been running yeah i know i see i've seen from youtube and from instagram it looks like a lot of goats <laughs> i've had i i just sold my goats the other day and i only had a dozen so <laughs> Sure, sure, it, it's sure. A little bit more than that. I was going to say that's just you know that it's just matching your resource base. You know, like you saying you have twelve goats for the part of the world that you're in. You really shouldn't. You know, it wouldn't make sense to be running that many goats. You know, it. it and a lot. I think a lot of times that's our biggest problem in livestock agriculture, or at least on grazing side of of people are most interested in the animal, you know, and they need to take a better look at, at their their land resource that they do have access to and, and better matching their animal to that land resource rather than being caught up in, I need to run this type of animal. They need to look at, okay, I had this sort of vegetation, this kind of growing season, this kind of dormant season, et cetera, et cetera, and, and start from that baseline. Oh, I think you're making an excellent point there. And that that's one reason my go hurts small. I don't have enough brush and right. and browse for them. So I've sold them for now and I have hair sheep and beef cattle. Maybe at some point that changes, but right now I have to agree that was an excellent point about matching your livestock species to what you have available. Yeah. Now when you you started grazing three years ago, four years ago? Yeah, we turned out uh, May of 2017. Oh, yes. And when you when you started that, were you using two wire portable fences at that time or? When I first started, no, I wasn't. I started in a, in a, a smaller pasture. You know, I've kind of stair-stepped this. I didn't start out with 300 goats. I started out right. with 40, 45 and I was in one pasture 
and uh, we turned those goats out. It's about 130 acre pasture, very brushy. It's kind of an odd shaped little pasture, very long. It's sandwiched between a highway and a railroad. But point is, is we turned them out, and uh, we that first uh, I didn't start using a temporary electric fence until February of 2018. So I had those goats just running out in this one pasture, okay. and so then some problems ensued and you know it took me a while to to kind of learn and fig, you know it's a big learning curve you know i for a guy that never owned a oh. goat before and then you're you're gonna turn them out and and see oh, how you yes. get along you know so it took me a while to get there but uh you know i, I saw the problems of, of you know i knew about all the problems as far as the forage was concerned and all the benefits with with rotational grazing or managed intensive grazing if you want to go that that next step from reading and, and all the resources I'd been looking at to, to even get the idea oh, yeah. to turn goats out. But um, I didn't really understand um, from the, the predation side and the mothering instinct side of those goats, the benefits of, of keeping them bunched and keeping them in smaller areas versus having them be able to spread out and, and go and go all the way to a fence and bounce off it and go all the way to another fence and bounce oh, off yes. it. Um, so, uh, I had some predation go on and, and uh, I, I knew I needed to, to get um, some more guard dogs, but I also knew I, I needed to, you know, do more. I couldn't buy enough guard dogs to fix my problem. I knew I needed a smaller area. So, you know, that's when I decided I, I got to find a way to make this work for these goats of keeping them inside of electric. And, and that's when I started down that path. Yeah. So how did you get down to, I assume you didn't put up two wires and they stayed in. Or, or were you able to? Yes, no. I put up three wires. and but, oh, yeah. but, but what I did do is I started that right before I started kidding out. I kind of thought to myself, okay, if I'm going to put this work and effort in, I'm going to do it when a, a time when I know it's going to be the most beneficial to me. And I knew that, that when we, we kid out, you know, a lot of times in pasture settings, those goats want to kid and then they want to walk off and leave those kids. So I thought, okay, we're going to get them bunched up for kidding. And so I put up three strands and somehow I, th I don't know if it was just because they were kidding out and they were kind of just bonded to that little area at the time, but put up three oh, strand, yes. three strands and they stayed in. I don't know how, but it worked out. Oh, yes. So, and then, uh, you know, I, I worked from that point and, and went to two strands and got that to work. However, this past fall, I, I bought a bigger bunch of goats and, and built up my herd and I bought a bunch of nanny kids, seven month old nanny kids. Okay. And bought a big group of them and brought them in. Well, anyhow, I didn't, I didn't do as a good enough job getting them trained to those wires. And I did have a lot of issues with them, with those goats getting out and it was, it was an ordeal. Oh yeah. And I, I had to back up and do a better job of, of getting them broke and did spend about a week of putting them up against a hot wire on a good permanent fence with that temporary fence offset from that permanent fence about eight to 10 inches. And I put feed out, feed out on the ground right next to that fence. And, and they, you know, got hit and hit and hit by it and got them broke to it that way. How hot's your fence running? Generally got about 7,000 volts is what I'm shooting for. Obviously a little bit more is, is okay, is better. But right in that seven thousand volts neighborhood is is what I've experienced to be to be hot enough to get those goats trained and broke to that wire. Oh yes, and you you have a portable solar energizer. Yeah. What what brand do you have? What's your setup like? On um, that? I've got a Stay Fix six joule energizer, and then I've got a I think it's it's a hundred watt uh, solar panel to complement it. It's got a little charge protector on it that's between the, the panel and the energizer. I couldn't tell you what brand that is. I don't know how, how important that is, but that's the setup I've got there. And generally, I've been running two ground rods with that energizer. I probably I should be running three, but I don't. I really hate pounding those things in the ground every time. So, <laughs> so right. I, I, I've cheaped out a little bit. But the point is, it's been effective, and I haven't burned anything up yet on the equipment side. So that's my setup. Very nice. Yeah. My next question was about those ground rods because right. those things aren't much fun. Right. But if two's working for you, if it's working for your equipment and animals, that's what you need. Now you talked about what you're grazing there, the 
the brush and stuff. What are some of the species that you're seeing there? On the brush side, you know, what I see, my what we have and what my goats are eating, we've got sumac. We've got two different types of sumac. The smooth sumac, it's kind of like a small tree. But we also have yes. something called uh, skunk bush sumac, which it's it's an actual bush. And I don't know if it would be as far north as where you guys are, but they really like we that. We have some sumac, but I really haven't looked into it too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't know that I've seen the bush type. Right, right. But we could have it. Yeah. They'll In the wintertime, I'll see them. They'll eat cedar. They don't really eat cedar trees so much during the warm time of the year. But when it cools off, I believe my understanding there's kind of a chemical change that goes on inside those plants and uh, makes makes them more palatable and, and those goats, oh, yes. will, goats will eat on those cedar trees same thing not the same thing but uh, even in the real dead of winter we'll, they'll eat some prickly pear uh, not a lot of nutrition there but they'll you know that's something that i would never have thought they would have ate on but they will right um even you know we've got a fair bit of mesquite down here mesquite trees and they'll they'll work on those sometimes you know even late in the year like right now just yesterday i was out in the pasture you know and was watching them eat on mesquite trees we've got a lot of different types of oak trees down here through the growing season and and they really like those oak trees you know red oaks we've got something called a post oak and and black oaks and they'll eat those we also have down here in my part of the world we have something called a live oak it stays green almost the entire year. So through the winter time, it'll be green. It's similar to the cedar tree. It goes under some sort of chemical change in its leaves when the, the weather cools off or the days get shorter and that leaf becomes more palatable. And, and those goats will really, will really eat those live oak trees a lot. And that, that's a lot of their diet through the winter time I, I, from what I can, what I gather. Of course, we got quite others that, that I see me you know, eat on as far as the brush goes. Now, you mentioned there about live oak staying green throughout the year. Well, how's your winter in that area? Our winters, are they're variable I, is the best way I can say. Maybe everybody <laughs> gives that answer. You know, it's just, it's just to, to, to what degree. Everybody's like, well, we don't have the same winter every year again and again. I, <laughs> All I, right. I, yeah. I, hear, I hear that from, from a lot of people that live in different parts of the country. So I, I guess I'm going to say the same answer. But as far as like, let's say freezing, we do freeze here but it, it's not going to last more than three days. You know, it, since, you know, I've been, I've been down here for 10 years now and, and that's been my experience. We certainly, uh, you know, get a fair bit of rain and moisture through the dormant season. And that probably doesn't help you so much on growing, but recharges our, our soil and, and water tables and everything that time of year. But a lot of days that get down to the, to the 40s at night and, and uh, you know, days that get up to the 60s during the day for the high, 50s maybe for the high through, through winter time, it, you know, that's, that's kind of typical, yeah. When's your first freeze typically and last freeze? The actual days, I'm not sure I could tell you. I, I think we might average something in the early November time for our first freeze, but I, I, I'm sorry to say I, I, I'm not farmer enough to, to know that off the top of my head. <laughs> But yeah, right there in the, in the early part of November, I think is maybe a uh, an average freeze for us. I think I, I would suspect around that we're usually uh, last of October, first of November. So yeah, that makes yeah, sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, on your goats and moving them, do you have ponds they're watering out of, or do you have a creeks, or how do you manage the water for them? Where I'm at, I'm all surface water. I don't have any. I don't have access to any piped water whatsoever. So we're um, oh yes. That is one good thing about, you know, I, I kind of whine a little bit about the fences, but we have a fair many number of tanks or ponds or reservoirs or whatever part of the country you're in, uh, you're going to call them. But we have quite a few of those in there and they're spread out. So that makes the rotational thing more plausible with just having surface water. We do have quite a few seasonal creeks that run through the place. Oh, yes. You know, that's one thing about a goat or even a sheep. They don't require near as much water as a mother cow, even, I mean, pound for pound is what I'm talking about, you know, not per head. So they can get by on quite a bit less. Even accessing it, you talk about creeks, these seasonal creeks, you know, they're not going to flow, but they'll have pools and things like that scattered out to them. And it might be some, you know, really steep banks to get down to it or a lot of brush or rocky ledges. 
those goats, they'll travel down to the bottom of that thing and get them a drink. Whereas I'm not, I'm not sure that you would want to do that with a, a group of mother cows, you know, or you know, you wouldn't want to depend on that oh, right. type, I, I think, in my opinion. So it makes it easier for these goats to scatter them out across this ranch or move them out across this ranch and always have a little bit of water to access. So, and then I will say in certain situations, in certain paddocks that I have, I've been known to haul a bit of water too, to make it work, or especially come July, August time when we do get pretty dry and, and some of those options start to dry up. Um, but once again, um, with the, uh, the requirements, water requirements on a goat, hauling water to a goat isn't near the chore as hauling the water, you know, to a few, to some cows. So it makes it yes. more justifiable, I guess. How big a paddocks are you, you putting your goats into and how often are you moving them? Well, due to one water restrictions, like we just talked about, and then also due to fencing traffic through the ranch, you know, we have deer hunters, we have got a railroad that goes through us. We've got high line power poles that run through us. We've got pipeline that runs through us. We're up against a highway. So, you know, sometimes we'll have encounters with DOT. So we've got a lot of different people that you know, are going to access the place from time to time. So I'm very cognizant about not fencing across ranch roads or what, like thinking about the flow of flow of traffic across the place. So all that, what I'm saying is all those things dictate where I put these, these temporary fences and, and make my paddocks as well as the, the creeks and, and ease of fencing sort of thing. But to answer your question, my paddocks vary in size quite a bit. I do have, you know, and that makes it management harder, of course, but um, they do vary quite a bit. I think that about the biggest paddock I have will be about 70 acres and the smallest one might be 12 acres sometimes. Yeah. So take that for what it's worth, but that that's kind of what I'm operating on currently. Now, when you, you have your goats in a paddock and you move on, how soon are you coming back around to that area to graze it again? During the, the growing season, you know, I'll, I'll probably make two passes over it in the growing season, you know, so that uh, might be a 60 to 90 day return thereabouts. Yes. And then, you know, probably graze it one time in the dormant season, maybe something, something to that effect. It depends a little bit, but like uh, I had a pasture that I hadn't been in for a year's work time that I just came out of. So if that answers your question a little bit, but you know, we're talking about 90 day rest, maybe 120 day rest, things like that. I figured it'd be pretty long rest considering browse because it takes it a little while to, to recover versus some of your forages. Right. Let's talk about your goats for just a minute. You said you've got boar Spanish cross does. Yeah. Basically I, I sourced the major the majority of my herd came off one ranch in south of San Angelo, Texas. And this is somebody that's ran their goats for a long time, you know, a family type ranch. Oh, yes. And they have a, a strong boar influence in their herd with some, some Spanish background there. So oh, yeah. I would say, you know, if you were going to call it, my, my goats on average are five eighths to seven eighths boar is what I would call them. So my kid goats, I hauled some, some weather kids into the sale maybe three or four weeks ago. They were weighing about 60 pounds and uh, they would have been born, you know, first of April time. So they were oh, yes. five, five and a half months old, something like that. So that kind of gives you an idea of what, you know, how they grow from, from birth to, to that time frame. What kind of buck are you using? Coming off the same ranch, so same type, oh, of, okay. same type of genetics. Yeah, he's a, allowed me to source source some billies from him, and so it, it was very similar genetics. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. And you have guardian dogs with them. What type of guardian dogs have you gone with, and and are you pleased with them? I do. I have five guard dogs at this moment, and they are basically a an Anatolian Pier, Great Pyrenees cross. The dogs range in age from, I guess our youngest dogs are a little over 18 months old. I got two dogs that are 18 months old and the others would be 
three-year-old dogs. That's what they'd be, three-year-old oh, dogs. Yes. And so, like I say, Great Pyrenees Anatolian Cross, I raised two dogs, and the others I purchased, you know, off from a uh, rancher, a goat rancher, you know, some uh, an actual producer as opposed to a, uh, just a straight dog breeder, you know. Um, I think yes. that's, that's a very important thing that anybody considering this, that they would purchase their dogs from somebody, from a working operation. Somebody that's running the same type of stock that you're going to put those dogs on is, is very important. So I've been fairly happy with my dogs. I've got to cut the younger dogs that give me a little bit of issue traveling about, but by and large, they, they stay with the goat. I'm still amazed sometimes that it works at, at the way it does. You know, uh, those are amazing animals. And to just have them turned out there in the pasture and, and you, you know all the things that are out there that, that would make a kid go to snack really fast and, and they, you know, they keep them off of them. So I'm very pleased with it. And that's maybe one of the most unexpected, neatest things that I've come across with this raising goats endeavor better understanding these guard dogs and their past and and how they were developed over thousands of years and and all that that's gone in gone into them it's a pretty amazing story once you start digging down into it oh yes very good this part of our podcast we do our famous four questions the questions okay. we ask the all of our guests so our first one what's your favorite grazing grass or or farming related book or resource well, I'm a pretty big fan of most of anything of Jim Garrish's. There, there's a lot of a lot of guys out there who are very knowledgeable and, and do a good job. I, I've kind of felt like his documents or his books, rather, they're just maybe a little easier for me to read and apply. I think uh, just writes things in such a manner that, that it seems very practical and, and you can apply it to your operation a little easier. So he, he's one, and then I'll, I'm going to have two just because I want to have two. But um, there you go. <laughs> there's a guy named uh, Walt Davis that wrote a book, How to Not Go Broke Ranching. And uh, he's an Oklahoma, Texas guy. He's ranched in those parts of the world. So that's what really, I guess, I really like about him because it applies a lot to, to the where I'm at. And uh, it was actually the book that I read that kind of really – made the light bulb turn on for me to consider grazing goats with with mother cows or with cattle at all. I hadn't really read a whole lot of, about doing that, and he addresses that in his book, some um, of that multi-species grazing. And so I, I really liked it for that and, and gives a lot of practical insight for uh, starting into that. Very good. I've, I've pulled up his website here. I have not seen his books. I, I'm gonna have to add that to my reading list. I mean, I'm serious. You should read that book. It's it's good, and it's it's not an easy read, or it's easy to read the book. It's it's not uh, right. super technical, or, or you know, it's it's not that hard to to read it. Well, I look forward to to looking at that and getting it and reading it myself. Our next question: What tool could you not live without on your farm? Energizer. <laughs> yeah, those those goats. If that's not running hot, you're yeah. You've yeah. got goats everywhere. Right, right. Well, yeah. just just the Energizer itself, you know, just to have that and to have this, you know, the solar capability to not have to plug into something, you know, that that's huge for, for the specific thing that I'm doing, you know. Uh, right. I, w- I wouldn't be able to do it without it. Yes. What is something you would tell someone just getting started in, in farming, grazing grass, forages? I would say to grow from where you are at and start today good advice on that starting today so often today becomes tomorrow becomes five years becomes 10 years i suffer a little bit from that (laughs) and where can our listeners find out more about you and what you're doing well i have a a youtube channel that i've been posting videos on for a little while now it's under just my name ben hobbig um but uh, you can go there and and see some of the, the videos i've made about Oh, our dog feeders and and moving our goats and just different things that uh, about my operation about how I, how I get those things done. Very good. We've we've enjoyed this, Ben. Appreciate you coming on and being on our podcast. I've had a great time. I, I just uh, I feel so lucky to be on a podcast. I've ne- this is my first one, so it, it's pretty pretty neat to to get to do this with somebody and. And know that maybe somebody out there is going to listen to it and, and get some, you know, some benefit out of it. And, and uh, 
make their operation a little bit better. I think that's really neat. And I'm sure they will because you, you've you opened my eyes up to some ideas that I'm going to ex- to look into a little right. bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even you don't have, you know, the one thing I figured out is you, you don't have to do it just, just like the person you're listening to. But if you just, you know, take one, one of the ideas and, and apply it, twist it a little bit to your operation and it can, and can really pull some things together for you. So true. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. All right. Thank you, Cal. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers produce forages for livestock. If you'd like to find out more about our show, be a guest on our show, or see more detailed show notes, visit us at grazinggrass.com. Until next time.